Hi, everybody. Welcome to the QB School. I am JT O'Sullivan. Today, we are talking about the opponent scout. When you're looking at an opponent scout, what is the first thing you are looking at? Fired up for this one. Let's dive into it. Welcome to the QB School. So the idea for this video came from a tweet I saw from first down underscore XOs. When doing opponent scout, what are some of the first things you're taking notes of when watching film? Love the prompt, love the engagement, but you are always going to get me to struggle a little bit to not make a joke at your expense with that type of diction. That being said, my response, do they have a dude? Do they have another dude? Repeat as needed. And then, life's not a bit. Hit me with the reply, possible video topic. So my tweet was really kind of an oversimplification, but it really did, I think, strike at the core of exactly what I look at when doing an opponent scout. Now, it might even be before you even turn on the film. You need to know, hey, is there an absolute game wrecker in your, on your opponent? And if there is, in my opinion, the best place to start as far as forming the plan when you're in season is to start from there and build out backwards. And so to be able to have basically an answer for that player in just about every single option that you go through. Because if you don't, you certainly don't want to get beat by their best player doing what they do best you know, consistently. Now, will it happen eventually? Absolutely. Especially if they are that much of a game wrecker. Sometimes you can't have answers all the time. But you want to have good options. So for me, it really does start there. Now, I'm going to give a little bit more of a detailed take here and really try to provide it through two different lenses. Now, this is called the quarterback school, so we're certainly going to start with the quarterback position and playing quarterback. But then we're also going to talk a little bit about play calling, offensive architecture, those types of things as far as what you want to do from that kind of building out beyond just, hey, do they have a dude? What else are we looking for? So starting with the quarterback, when I was playing, the first thing that I would want to look at all the time now, the other thing before I jump into this is to understand that football is a small sample size sport. So what does that mean? Depending on what your scouting kind of breakdown looks like, I would say most often, now it might be different nowadays with more access to more information, but when I was playing, it was essentially four games would be into the quote unquote breakdown. So when you look at the numbers of any sort of specific kind of tendencies or percentages, you're looking at a four game breakdown. Now, Within that, you have to understand that you're not doing the breakdown, most likely. There's maybe some sort of lower level coach, some sort of analyst, maybe if you're at the absolute highest levels. Now, if you're you know at the lower levels, maybe you are doing it. So you know exactly what that data is and the quality of that data. But I think it's worth unpacking. I've been in a number of quarterback meetings, breakdowns, looking at percentages, and you turn on the film and all of a sudden, hey, that doesn't look like the same coverage that I see marked down on the sheet. And there's can be a disconnect between what that looks like. So that's the first thing. You're going to have a small sample size. Then you're going to have some blurry or maybe mislabeled data also. But let's just operate under the assumption that everything is clean, which it isn't. But just as a form of argument, for me, when I was playing quarterback, first thing I wanted to know, what is the pressure percentage? And where is it most high? So what does that mean? That means where are they going to blitz? And what is the situation down in distance where that is most often the case? So for instance, you know, are they a you know, red zone pressure team? Are they a third and medium pressure team? Are they a, once you cross the 35 pressure team to knock you out of field goal range? Are they a you know goal line pressure team? Are they a backed up pressure team? Are they a you know, first and 10 after our earned first down pressure team. You know, all of those types of things can be baked in to an opponent scout. For me, playing quarterback, I always wanted to start with the pressure because that was something that I felt like I could at least potentially have answers to if I got any sort of significant tendency tell to be able to play that something that would resonate with me while I was playing. It doesn't matter if they come out and you look at the scouting report and, you know, first and long, after a penalty is, you know, 17% uh, pressure. Well, I'm not going to remember that on Sundays. But if it's third and medium and it's 50% two-man, 50% zero, I can remember that. And we're probably going to be in that situation. And so things like that, to me, resonate as far as things that I can potentially take with me onto the field that are pressure indicators information. And so it always started and stopped kind of once you get past the dude element to what's the pressure situation, specifically playing quarterback because you want to know where your hots are. 
everything really in the passing game quarterback wise for me starts with your understanding and your capacity to work within the protection scheme what does your toolkit look like to be able to protect yourself and get the ball out on time to the right guy consistently so pressure the next thing and this is really just kind of an overarching thing is kind of the base coverage structure so what are they are they middle field open are they middle field closed are they a post safety team are they a bracket team are they a man team are they a zone match team what is their day one mini camp one installation look like on defense what do they try to base their structure on now you can't always tell but usually you can have a pretty good idea most coaches know each other most coaches have a decent understanding of that right out the gate and it doesn't mean that they're going to live in that or be in that all the time that year but just to have an understanding of how they build their system i think goes a long way to understanding maybe some of the rules some of the little nuances that they'll be asking their players to do and again this is playing quarterback at what i would consider a high level so pressure uh, base coverage from there and this is where it's going to start to kind of bleed into kind of the elite elite levels for me you're going to get into third get third down so third down in the nfl is its own animal and every team will break it down a little bit different as far as down and distance whether it's third and short yardage third and two to three third and short third and medium you know where did those yard lines break down third and long third and real long you know third down in the red area third down backed up things like that that are maybe a little unique or one-off but to me third down is its own animal so understanding maybe again what are the pressure indicators in third down what are their most common pressures in third down where do they like to kind of if they have barriers as far as when the heat turns up as far as pressure understanding that and then the coverage elements will usually be a little bit more exotic in third down as well from there my mind always goes to red zone again these are things you can hopefully take into the game so pressure base calls third down and then red zone now lower levels of ball there might not be a red zone defense it just might be their defense all the way down an easy way to tell is if they play with a post safety inside the five that's just probably their defense now in the league you're going to get a bunch of different red zone type defenses and depending on where it changes it can be different for every team uh, I really think of the green, red area, anything once you can kick a field goal. I think defenses most likely will change because defense coordinators don't want to give up those three points. And if they know, let's just say the yard line is the 35 in the league, you know, once you get around that 35-ish high 30s, you're going to see pressure tick up. You Once you get into the 20 area, you're going to see all sorts of different red zone variations, whether it's red quarters, red two, different zero pressures, different you know, zone type pressures with different types of coverages behind it. To me, understanding what they want to be in the red area, again, as their base, doesn't mean that they will be. It's just a neat, easy indication of something you can actually take into the game. So pressures, base calls, third down, red zone area. And then really the last one that I think you can actually carry with you into the game is a gotta have it call. So if there is enough film in the breakdown, and usually at higher levels there will be, and most of these coaches, again, know each other pretty well. And even players start to know the coach as well if you play long enough to have an understanding of, okay, this is a got to have it situation. Fourth and five, fourth and eight, fourth and three, two-point conversion. What does this defense want to be in? Do we anticipate zero? Do we anticipate some sort of man coverage? Do we anticipate some sort of pressure? What can we anticipate in a got to have it situation? And so if you can go into a game into an opponent scout with what you think is credible information for all of those things. So pressure, base calls, third down, red zone, got to have it situations, maybe some two minute situations if you get into that kind of depth with your situational ball. But for me, those, those are a lot of things to carry week in and week out to have a different understanding of what that looks like from the quarterback position. So that's from the quarterback position. Now, from the actual play caller position, and I'm only going to talk about this anecdotally. This is certainly more focused at the high school level. Never call plays any other level, but I will say that for me, again, simply, it starts and stops. Do they have a dude? Do they have multiple dudes? And if they have multiple dudes, you better make sure that you got more dudes than they have. And even then, it doesn't necessarily match up depending on what the positions look like. So for me, what does that look like? How fast can we identify who those people are? And do we need to have a specific plan for those people? Now, just as kind of an anecdotal example, this past season, I think we played 13-ish games. We'll go with 13. Uh, I would say that just under half of the teams probably had a dude that we had to necessarily have a plan with. Now, some of them are 
guys that are going to be, you know, potentially power five guys that will really wreck the game all the time if you don't have a specific plan where they are. Other guys are just really good high school football players that it would do you a disservice to not have a plan to at least try to block them consistently if they're at the near or at or near the line of scrimmage. Or if they're on the back end, let's just throw to the other side. Or can we manipulate to not have to play to that guy? And so just having an understanding and a being adaptive in that plan to be able to take advantage of where those dudes are. And if they have multiple dudes, then it gets a lot more complex and then it's usually a lot better team. So from there, now I will also say, for example, this past year, there was a team we played that had an absolute beast on the edge as far as a kind of an edge-ish rusher. Now, for me, as a kind of personal mistake, we certainly tried to have a plan for what that where that guy was going to be. But you have to be adaptive to, hey, if, that's, if the plan... If it's, he's not lining up where you anticipate him lining up, are you flexible enough to make a difference or to make a, adjustments in game, in t- in real time, in the series, at halftime, to be able to take advantage of those things? And or the other part of that game that I ma- made many mistakes myself was they had more than one dude. Now, the one dude was so good that he kind of popped off the film and made everyone else on the film in the preparation look like they weren't quite as good or maybe my own kind of myopic lens was like, oh my gosh, we got to have a plan for this guy. Well, in reality, they had a couple other half dudes that put together all of a sudden were now a collective problem. So being able to make sure that you identify the dude or dudes and where they are and not just kind of going off on your own lane as far as once you identify, hey, this guy's a real problem, make sure there aren't other problems out there as well. So my own kind of learning moments for y'all. From there, I really wanted to know very similar to the quarterback wise, what are their base calls? So what does their day one install look like? Usually in high school, you can tell pretty quickly. Are they an even, an odd? Do they have the capacity to get into a bear, a mint, a sink, uh, front wise? Are they multiple in their fronts? What does their back end look like? Do they want to be closed? Do they want to be open? Are they more of a zone, a man team? What are their number, you know, what are their high call pressures? Uh, Those types of things that I think can at least build a foundation. Now that doesn't mean that that's what you're going to see. And that's at least been my experience at the high school level. Uh, I think it's valuable to know what the base is, what they want to be. But in my experience, m- at least versus us, so much of what we saw defensively was what I would consider bespoke, a la carte, uh, stuff you wouldn't see on the film that all of a sudden shows up when you're playing them. And so for me, this is where the op- opponent scout at the lower levels kind of takes a back seat to what you do, your system, your offensive framework. Does it provide multiple options, multiple answers versus anything? And so for us as kind of just working backwards as far as what we were running offensively, we were very multiple. Uh, we had a number of different personnel. We had a bunch of formations, shifts, uh, some motion to be able to get in what we wanted and get in what we thought was the advantageous personnel and cause some issues with our different flanks. And so you know, how you would line up to those flanks, you know, you wouldn't see a whole lot of, you know, unbalanced wing, unbalanced bunch, zero by four, or at least I wasn't seeing it in what we were exchanging. And so you have to be flexible, but also understand that, hey, the way that I would explain it to our team is, hey, we anticipate this team being, for example, an even quarters team. Now, have we faced anybody that comes out and plays true quarters versus us all the time in a simple, even you know, over under front. No, they're going to have some sort of plan to try to deal with what we did well. And what we did well was run the rock. And so you're going to have to bring more people to the line of scrimmage. Uh, That's going to cause some bigger things down the field, potentially to open up. But when we turn on the film, it was more about, Hey, understand where this guy is. Uh, Let's have a plan. If they're in their even, if they're in their bear, you know, if they're coming after us with pressure, we'll get into different calls. And so to explain the base element of it, but also always build in the adaptive, flexible nature of what we were able to do. And so for me, it was a real learning experience after the first year of being of kind of taking what was what I consider like a Sunday model, not necessarily of the depth of the preparation, but just uh, the understanding of, hey, this is what they are on film. This is what they're going to be. Well, you know, we're not seeing any of that. You know, now is it because, you know, we do some different things that maybe other people in the area don't do for whatever reason or their opponents don't do? Are they that flexible? Are they that multiple? Are people going to have a plan if you're really good at offense? Yeah, the answer is yes. And so to be able to understand what that looks like and be flexible and have it baked into your system to take advantage of it. And so we wouldn't bang our head against, 
you know, the film saying, hey, you know, this is going to be a 75% pressure team in third down. Well, not versus us, they're not. And so to understand that it's going to be a little bit different if you run a little bit of a different system. And I think most people nowadays, you know, depending on unless you're a 10 personnel open edge team, you know, you have the potential to get into a lot of multiple different types of sets to be able to get into the, essentially the flank you want with the personnel you want to be able to take advantage of what that bespoke a la carte defense looks like. You know, we played against a number of teams that I would consider jumped into their goal line, a goal line type gapped out front that, you know, for us, you know, didn't necessarily change things, made things a little bit harder if we were going to try to get inside or do some things that we were no used to doing versus kind of bubble front teams. But beyond that, it's nice to be able to get into exactly what you want, whether it's an if-then mentality as far as a play caller. But for me, it was just the ability to understand, hey, just because it's on film doesn't mean that you're going to see it. Where I think in the league, you know, you're going to get some one-off weekly pressures. You're going to get maybe some dialed up tendency breakers, but you're not going to get, you know, totally new fronts, totally new personnel. There's not going to be some game record that you don't never heard about that they signed from the practice squad. Those types of things don't happen. Where in high school, there might be some transfer that's eligible week six that you never seen, didn't know was on the team, shows up, and all of a sudden we can't block in the first series. And so baking in that flexibility, I think, helped me a lot. The other thing that I would look at that, again, was not necessarily anecdotally what we did because we weren't a necessarily a drop back half slide team but for me I'm always going to default to the pressures what are their what are their most called pressures do they have the capacity to do one off pressures based on the opponent do they change their pressure every week are they always trying to get two on the back are they always trying to get one on ones up front what do they want to get with their pressures and from there, being able to bake that into your pass protection, uh, depending on what you run, can be difficult and can be where you kind of really spend your time. Now, for us, anecdotally, we were a you know max protection, full slide, play action type passing thing. So it wasn't huge for us to know where the hots are, you know where our duel is, things like that. I just squashed that stuff because we just wasn't what we did best, and so. Our answers were easier because it's easier to just say, hey, they're coming from the field, full slide into the field. Good luck. You know, where they might win, but hopefully we have a guy and a half. Hopefully they have to take the long track. Things like that that are baked into whatever you do. And so if you're a drop back, five person protection, six person protection, you're certainly going to spend significantly more time than I did in the past pro world and the pressure world to be able to better understand what that looks like. Now, the end of this thing here, this is just my own truth with the process most high school staffs ours included when we were coaching you know we weren't spending a whole lot of time doing scouting of our opponent because we were honestly more concerned with making sure our stuff we just weren't good enough to be able to adapt stuff all the time and so it was hey this is our rules these are our rules this is what we do it doesn't matter what the hell they do the system has the answers, the toolbox to be able to run it against just about anybody. Now, we can certainly help ourselves by being in, you know, taking advantage of angles and maybe some misalignment and things like that, different tempos and all the types of options that offenses have. But we're not going to change our rules, change our pass pro rules, change what we change our identity week to week. We just, I, I didn't think, I'm not sure you're good enough at, you know, lower levels of football to be able to do that or even high enough levels to, to do that. I always think people freak out if they have tendencies, and I'm kind of the opposite, to be honest with you. If you don't have tendencies, in my opinion, you're probably not very good. That's just the truth. Let me say that again. If you don't have tendencies, you're probably not very good at anything. Now, maybe you go out there and you spread it out evenly to all five eligibles, and you run past screen, you know, 50%, 50%, mix in some screens all the time, you know, those types of things. Maybe you do some RPOs, maybe you do some wing T. Most people don't. So my, my thing about it is let's have the tendencies. Let's make sure they have options and rules that allow us to run it versus many things. But let's not hit our head against the wall if what we're doing isn't working or they have a dude that we didn't prepare for. Let's make sure we have enough options and answers to be able to at least have a chance to be successful. So kind of in summary at the end here, uh, a long-winded, short, concise summary here. Do they have a dude? Do they have multiple dudes? If they don't, 
okay? Or if they do, we'll deal with it. We got to have the capacity to deal with it. Now, just because you have the capacity to deal with it doesn't mean you will deal with it also. You know, oftentimes there's a dude for a reason and it's going to be an issue all game. But beyond that, for me, quarterback wise, if we're playing quarterback, what are their pressures? What's the pressure percentages in certain down and distance? Can we get any indicators or tells that will help us in the game? What's their base structure coverage wise? What shell are they? What are they a man or a zone team? Third down, red zone, got to have it situations. Then play caller wise, again, dudes, again, base calls, pressures, coverages. From there, do they have the capacity to be a la carte, to be bespoke? Are they changing their defense when they're playing their opponent, common opponents for you, what you think you are as a program? From there, you got to make sure you have the baked in capacity to be able to have those answers. And then again, what are the pressures? Do they have easy tendencies indicators to be able to say, hey, we're going to get zero at a two point conversion for sure. We're going to get zero in a fourth and got to have it situation. If you can have all of those things, I think you have yourself a pretty decent, consistent opponent scout. Now, will you have the same opponent scout versus every opponent? No. You know, rivalry week, rivalry opponent, coaches you know really well, players you know really well, there will be some more depth and detail depending on the opponent. But if you can get just those kind of bare bones, that foundation, I think will go a long way for you to having a strong opponent scout consistently.